So in a cell, um, and this, uh, so prokaryotic cells, eukaryotic cells, glycolysis just happens in the cytoplasm. Okay. Uh, so this is a eukaryotic cell. Um, this is a prokaryotic cell. Um, glycolysis just happens in the cytoplasm. Now, in a eukaryotic cell, this is a horribly out of scale mitochondrion. The Krebs cycle happens inside the mitochondrion. The mitochondrion is actually two membranes, so the so it divides. Uh, so the mitochondrion has two separate spaces. The Krebs cycle happens inside the inner space. In a prokaryotic cell, in a bacterium or an archaean, um, the Krebs cycle happens uh, just right there in the cytoplasm. Um, now the electron transport chain, we're going to talk about it mainly in, in terms of a mitochondrion, but the electron transport chain is a series of molecules that are sort of embedded inside the inner membrane of the mitochondrion. So here is a huge mitochondrion. And like I said, there are two membranes in a mitochondrion, the outer membrane and the inner membrane. Inside the inner membrane, we call it the mitochondrial matrix. Mitochondrial matrix. And this in-between space, in between the outer membrane and the inner membrane, we just call that the intermembrane space. And out here, this is just the cytoplasm of the cell, so that, that's just huge um, beyond the boundaries of this piece of paper. So this is the mitochondrion, and like I said, the Krebs cycle happens inside here. So the mitochondrion, there's, there's the mitochondrion, and here's the inner membrane. Since the Krebs cycle happens in here, there's going to be this, this it's going to produce NADH. Now, NADH is a high energy molecule because it has um, an electron that it would that, that makes it less stable. Um, so if it can give up that electron to the electron transport chain and in doing so become NAD plus again, so that's an electron, then then this gets to take its more stable form. So this is one of those exergonic reactions, passing the electron to the electron transport chain. The electron um, is going to join this first molecule in the electron transport chain. The elect elect electron transport chain is just a series of molecules that are just really good at passing electrons from one to the other. Um, every time it passes the electron, the electron is a little bit more stable. It's with a molecule that is more electronegative, better at attracting electrons. And so every time the electron moves from one molecule to the next, it loses a little bit of energy. It becomes a little bit more stable. FADH2 is also a high energy electron carrier and it's going to do the same thing. It's going to give an electron to the electron transport chain and in doing so it's going to revert to its low energy state, the FAD. So these molecules in the electron transport chain embedded in the inner membrane of the mitochondrion, they pass the electron along and the electron loses energy. That energy can be harvested, can be used by these molecules to do some work. So these molecules not only pass the electron along, but they take some of the energy from the electron and use it to do something. And what is it that they do? I'm just going to draw another set of molecules here. Um, they pump H plus ions, um, hydrogen plus ions. Um, they're also called protons because you know that's what a hydrogen atom without its electron would be, it would just be a proton. So it, it pumps protons from the inside, from the mitochondrial matrix, into the intermembrane space. So you can think of the intermembrane space as being really full of these H plus ions, that is really acidic, really full of H plus ions. Now this is a gradient, it's called a proton gradient. Um, it's a sort of a charge and concentration gradient. And like any gradient, it's far from equilibrium. It's unstable. It's a high energy situation. H pluses can't just push back into the mitochondrial matrix um, by diffusion because they're charged particles and these membranes are you know, made of the same thing that other membranes are made of. They're, um, they're mostly lipid, so charged things don't push through them. The only way they can get back through is through these 
these enzymes called ATP synthase. ATP synthase. And you can probably guess from the name that what the ATP synthase does is it allows the H plus back in. And when the H plus pushes back in, the energy that's released by alleviating that little bit of proton gradient, that little bit of what they call the proton motive force, um, by allowing that little bit of um, gradient to uh, be relieved, that energy is used to turn an ADP into an ATP. Okay, so, um, so once again, ATP synthase. Let's a proton through. And when that proton is allowed back through, the energy that's released when that proton is allowed back through is used to drive this endergonic reaction, turning an ADP uh, and a phosphate into an ATP. And so the energy, so, so the summary here is that it's really just a lot of um, energy transformations. Um, what we've done here is we've turned ADP into ATP. That's endergonic. Where'd the energy for that come from? The energy from that came from a uh, crowded proton being allowed to become an uncrowded proton. Where did the energy come from to, to make that proton crowded to begin with? Well, that energy came from our energy flows. That energy came from um, uh, high energy electron being allowed to become a low energy electron. And where did that high energy electron come from? That came from NADH or FADH2. And, you know, the electron is released when the NADH becomes NAD, or the FADH2 becomes FAD. And where did these um, NAD, yeah, where did these NADHs and FADHs come from? They came from the Krebs cycle. So it turns out that um, each of these NADHs that gives its energy to the electron transport chain, which gives its energy to the proton gradient, which gives the energy to the phosphorylation of ADP into ATP. Every one of these NADHs gets us three ATPs. And every one of the FADH2s gets us two ATPs. So, sorry, I hope I didn't make anybody see these uh, shufflings. So if we look back at, um, at what glycolysis and the bridge reaction and the Krebs cycle gave us. We have four ATPs. So those are just ATPs. We have two FADH2s or uh, four ATPs. And the, we have uh, the 10 NADHs and that gets us 30 ATPs. So if you add that up, that's 38 ATPs per glucose. Now there's a trick, uh, or there's a tri tricky situation that I should mention. Uh, you'll remember that before I said that um, in eukaryotes, the Krebs cycle happens inside the mitochondrion, but in prokaryotes, uh, the Krebs cycle just happens in the cytoplasm. It turns out that um, in eukaryotes, like, like our cells, um, it takes a couple of ATPs to get the pyruvic acid from the cytoplasm into the mitochondrion. So yeah, we, we make 38 ATPs per glucose, but minus two, uh, because we have to spend an extra two to get the pyruvic acid into the mitochondrion. So we only make 36 ATPs per glucose, um, whereas prokaryotes make the full 38. It's not a big difference, but it's just something to keep in mind.